Today I'm finally ready to put together my 486 DOS PC. This is going to be a little bit relaxed of a video. There isn't a script or a plan or anything, we're just going to go ahead and put the computer together and see what happens. A few of the parts I'm putting in the computer today were sent to me by some very awesome and generous viewers, and I want to say thank you to those who sent something in. I'm not putting in all of the parts I have for this computer today, and I'm going to have it evolve over time. This probably also isn't going to be the only DOS computer I build, as I have a need for having a couple of these on hand. Now let's begin by taking a look at what parts we're going to be putting in here, starting with the case. This is an Inwin A500, the smaller version of the Inwin Q500 that I built my new Windows 98 PC in. I really like the Inwin 500 series of computer cases for their removable motherboard tray and other myriad of usability features that just makes them really awesome to work with. I was so dead set on using this, I even bought a brand new ATX style AT power supply that I could put in here, and it fits and works tremendously. So I was all ready to move forward using the A500 matching my Windows 98 PC. That is until I found this. An even taller case than the Inwin Q500. This behemoth is over 26 inches tall, features an awesome, huge red power switch, a turbo button, and frequency display. But most importantly, it is unused, like new. This thing is crying out to be built. So today, we're going to do that. So it's time to move on and put the first parts in here, which will be the motherboard and processor. The motherboard I'll be using is a Biostar MB8433UUD-A. Now, this is a Socket 3 motherboard, and I was sent this pre-configured with an Intel DX4-00PR100 overdrive chip. The Intel overdrives are an interesting little subclass of processors available at the time. This doesn't say 486 anywhere on it, but it is in fact a 486DX4100. It is a 100 megahertz processor. Some of the differences on here are obviously the heatsink and the fact that it has built-in voltage regulation. So some other boards that may not be able to support a processor that uses the voltage that this one does could be used with it because of the onboard regulation. You had weird processors like the Intel overdrives because motherboard support was a bit wild west for processors at the time. These jumpers are used to configure which processor you're using on the motherboard. Matter of fact, those aren't even the only ones. There are some more over here. If you don't have these set correctly, you could end up damaging your CPU when you go to install it because you might feed it the wrong voltage or have it set for the wrong clock. Well, that wouldn't damage it, but it wouldn't run optimally. So knowing how to set your motherboard is something you have to do with an older computer like this. One of the reasons it's taken me so long to get to this video is I wanted to make sure I got it right. So I know that this motherboard is configured correctly for this processor. The jumper settings are actually for an AM46DX4, but it's been working just fine with this one. Now, interestingly, I have the processor in the socket here, but it's not keyed and you can put it in four different ways. Obviously, only one of these ways is going to work correctly. So you need to know which way to put it, which you'll know by this dot matching up over here. So yeah, kind of crazy, the processors of the time. Now there's one more thing I need to mention before we move on, and that is the Dallas clock chip. Now these chips have a battery inside for keeping track of time while the computer is off. These batteries are known to go bad and then the clock doesn't work. But some computers like this one also rely on that battery for holding motherboard settings. So if the battery goes bad, the motherboard kind of doesn't work because it won't keep any of your settings after a restart. Now, it's popular and common to modify these to use an external battery. I've gone ahead and done this already, and I'm not going to be showing you how I did that in this video. That's a bit beyond the scope of what I want to do here, but in the future I will show you how I did that. For now, I'll put some pictures up over here, because I was able to do it in a very nice way where you can't really tell that it was modified, other than the fact that now there's wires running out of it and there's a battery over there. 
Well, that's it for the microscopic features on this thing. Macroscopically, it's got four 16-bit ISA slots, three PCI slots, four EDO memory slots, an AT keyboard connector, a PS2 mouse connector, onboard IDE, floppy, parallel, serial. It's a really nice motherboard that's got a lot of features. And for the memory, I'm actually going to be putting in that now. Now, this uses EDO memory and... I have a couple sticks here, and I believe this comes out to 24 megabytes of memory when it's all added together. This was uh, the only configuration of the memory I could get to work that I have. I don't have a lot of this type of memory, so that's what I've got. Maybe in the future I'll upgrade this to max, which is 128 megabytes, but I really don't think I'm ever going to need that much on here. All right, now that we're done with the motherboard, it's time to go back to the case. But we have a problem. Um, this is kind of weird. I can't believe I didn't notice this until just now. Looking more at the bottom of the case, this is not a three and a half inch hard drive bay. This is two sideways, half height, five and a quarter bays. So there's nowhere to mount a three and a half inch IDE drive in here, which is fine. I'm not planning on using one of those. I'm gonna use an SD card ad adapter, but that's an XT motherboard backing. Remember that PS2 mouse port? Yeah, you're not going to be able to get to that if uh, that's put in here. So, that's a bit of a problem. Well, after some deliberation, I've decided I can live without the PS2 port. So, I'm going to move forward with this case, despite its uh, somewhat incompatibilities and faults. This case is also necked my new table here in a couple places, so that's annoying. Yep, also annoying is the fact that the only screw that holds this in place is underneath the battery connection now, so that sucks. Ah, uh, yeah. Of course, I hot glued the battery down, so now I can't get to that. Cool. Let's rip it off. Ugh, so dumb. All right, I'll fix that in a moment. Okay, something kind of interesting has happened here. Now, I figured since I can't use this PS2 port that I need to find a uh, serial connector that I could connect to these to have over here so I can actually use a mouse rather than trying to fit a, uh, another serial card in there because I'm probably not going to be able to with uh, all the parts I want to put in here. So I went looking for other AT computer cases I have that have uh, serial ports on a cable and these two computers both do i remembered that and sure enough i was able to find one now uh something else interesting happened um well two things here for one i didn't buy these computers at the same time i got one of these for free from someone and one i bought i don't remember which is which now um totally different times separated by years and it turned out i got two of the exact same case which is hilarious um one of these is a very, very poor sod that's actually a Pentium 1 running Windows XP. Um, but an interesting thing is that these cases would support the PS2 motherboard port on the board I'm using. So uh, that's kind of hilarious. But even more importantly, one of them had this in it, which is a parallel port and PS2 breakout. Now, this board has the PS2 port on board, but it also has a PS2 port header. So it should be possible for me to put this right here or down here, no, right here, where there's a slot that's not able to be accessed. And then I should have, whoops, the PS2 port again. So, Going and collecting old, weird computers paid off in this regard. I try not to do that, but every now and then I know I have to. Honestly, I pick these up mostly for the floppy cables because I just don't have a ton of those. Um, and this one's going to be very useful because it has the five and a quarter to three and a half inch adapters that this does not have any three and a half inch bays at all. So those will be nice. But uh, yeah, now I might be able to have PS2. It's just one slight problem. This is a keyed cable and the connector on here is not keyed. So I'm gonna have to pull out the motherboard and try and figure out which of these pins is not being used because I think it's the same pin out. Um, the serial port 
cable here it has eight pins, but one of them doesn't actually have a wire running through it. So that would be missing. And I've seen keyed serial port connectors before. So I think these are standard and I just need to do that. So this is uh, slightly better than I thought it was gonna be. I won't have any sacrifices using this case now. Oh, that feels good because I really wanna use this thing. Now I just, I just have to hope that the power supply doesn't end up being a dud because I don't have any other XT power supplies to swap in here. Got AT power supplies for days in the ATX form factor, but uh, yeah, none of the XT form factor. I only have the one and that's in, actually, oh no, I do have more XT power supplies. That's right, the same Goodwill I bought that other socket uh, seven motherboard from, I got an XT power supply. Okay. Wow, I'm, I'm better off than I thought. Cool. Anyway, uh, let's let's get the motherboard out so I can figure out the pin out and use uh, this. I have way too many computers and parts. This is, this is this is how my day goes. Any day you're using a multimeter to work on a computer, you're having a bad day. All right, now, thankfully, the keyed connector on the PS2 header actually had a pin that could be taken out, so it wasn't glued or melted shut or anything, so it was really easy to just get on there. And I can test the pinout matches by using continuity mode on my multimeter here, and it actually matches up perfectly. So I don't have to make any modifications at all four pins out of the six match up uh, over continuity test, and this only has four wires, so it's gonna work. It's perfect. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm not gonna lose the PS2 port, because there we go. All right, so there are all the breakout cables I'm gonna use with this motherboard. That is a lot. I'm thinking for the battery, I should glue it sideways so I can get to this stuff easily and the screw won't be obscured. Now, it does have exposed pins on the bottom. This one's kind of blocked. I can put a piece of tape over it, but this one will touch the shroud here. But a coin cell has positive on the top, negative on the bottom. This is the bottom, and the ground is connected to the shroud of the PS2 port. So it's already connected. So I can push this right up against that, and it's not a problem. Um, I will put a piece of tape over that just for safety and I will have no problem gluing that right there. Okay, the motherboard's back in, the battery's good, the PS2 port is going to work, and I just need to get that and all the other ports mounted now. So, let's go ahead and get started on that. Okay. Okay, now that that problem's all taken care of, it's time to get this thing wired into the case. So the AT power connection's easy enough. Just go ground to ground. So get that worked in there. And really snap very satisfyingly, but I think that's good. Okay. Um, the Molex powers we don't need yet. Um, the PC speaker is mounted all the way up at the top of the case, and the PC speaker connection is all the way at the other bottom of the case. So it unscrews and releases, thankfully. Let's see if we can find somewhere else to put it. Now, that was designed with this locking pin. Um, Hmm, that kind of sucks. I don't know how else that could be mounted. Maybe I could just put it somewhere like right here, maybe facing inside. That doesn't seem bad. Let's see if that'll work. Well, that's not desirable, but it's better not having a PC speaker. Okay, so this is one through four on JP1, which is all the way down there. All right. And uh, now the other ones, which are unlabeled, so I'm gonna have to trace them back up to the top and then figure out where they go down there. Okay, I've got all the front panel headers connected now after a 
bit of a complication, and I've set up the turbo indicator as well. Now I started out doing a segment on how to determine how to set up a turbo indicator that you don't know the pinout for, but it ended up getting a little more advanced than I thought and became six minutes long. So I'm going to release that as a separate video and add a little bit more information to it because I think it's worth covering on its own. But back to this, we should be ready to go. The motherboard has power. We have the inputs all fully connected. The only thing left to put in there to fire it up for the first time is video. And for that, I'm going to be going with this Diamond Stealth 24. Now I've already got this out of the box, but this should be a very good card for this computer. This is an SVGA card that has one megabyte of memory, uses an S3 chip, and is VGA. Now I do actually have some of the documentation and software that goes with this, including the Windows driver, so it should be fully possible to install Windows on here, although I'm not sure if this disk works. I think it might actually be bad. But this should be a card good enough to last through the life of this computer, although it is ISA, and I've heard that ISA cards are generally slower than PCI ones, so I might swap this over to a PCI video card at some point. But for now, this seems like a good route to go. All right, so let's go ahead and just pop that in there. And with that, the computer's basically ready to be booted up for the first time. So we're just going to need a monitor and a keyboard. The monitor is just a leading edge of 14 inch CRT. There's nothing particularly special about it. And the keyboard is a Gateway 2000 AT keyboard. I was originally going to use a Model M with an AT adapter for the PS2 interface, but I found this recently and well, I don't have a lot of AT keyboards, so I figure let's go ahead and give this a shot. The case is way too tall to fit it and the monitor in frame at once, so we're going to go ahead and two-step this. So let's turn on the computer for the first time and see how this goes. Oh, successful turboing! And if I turn turbo on, we drop down to 33. Oh yeah! And down here with the interface devices, we can see everything is going just fine. The processor is DX4 at 100 megahertz with 20 megabytes of RAM, and it's all looking good. We have a uh, CMOS checksum error, so the battery's, I guess, not working right, I don't know. And uh, floppy disks are not installed, which we know because we haven't put them in yet. Which, if we're going to want to load an operating system on here, we should do that next. All right, so for floppy drives on this system, the most important one we're going to need is for installing the operating system, which is going to be DOS 622. Now it says right up here that this DOS uses three and a half inch high density disks, which means we're going to want a 1.44 megabyte floppy drive. Now this case is weird and it has no three and a half inch base. So I'm going to use this five and a quarter adapter here, but this case is also weird, or I should say the power supply in that it doesn't have any three and a half inch uh, floppy drive power connectors. None. I don't know what the deal is with this whole case and setup and thing. I'm, I'm wondering if this is meant for a 286, actually. Um, not a 486. Well, maybe 386 is what I saw on the power supply. So it's just, it's strange. So anyway, I'm going to need a power adapter. I didn't have one on hand, so I just hacked up an old bad ATX power supply and a four pin big connector splitter. So now I can connect the power for the floppy drive through there. But while I'm in here installing that floppy drive, I may as well take care of drive B as well, which is a bit of a conundrum. Now, here we have a 1.2 megabyte drive, which would be more appropriate for an AT, and down here we have a 360K drive, which would be backwards compatible with XT class systems. Now, the 1.2 megabyte drive would be better for software that I would actually use on this computer, but for now I'm going to go with the 360K drive because I would like this to be an intermediary computer for stuff like my Compact Portable or IBM 5150. Obviously those computers have XT IDEs in them and you could, I could just pull out the Compact flashcards, but I really like using disks and I have software on disks, so it's going to be most useful to have uh, this floppy drive in here. Now I do know that on this floppy drive, which is a TAC-F 
50, 55 GFR. There is a way to configure the jumpers on here to run this drive at 300 RPM instead of 360 RPM. And I might investigate that later and put this drive in here. Um, this drive also uh, is 80 tracks, if I remember correctly, and this one will be 40. So this one has to double step. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, that I might look into later. But for now, I just want to go uh, the easy route on this. And uh, we'll actually be adding a couple more uh, floppy drives to this later. Really, this this computer actually started out uh, with the moniker Floppy Monster, and I had plans to have uh, four floppy drive connections, real floppy drive connections, but that proved to be very, very difficult to get a second floppy controller working, and I still don't know uh, how I can get that going. So once I get this whole system put together, that's going to be the first thing I take a look at. But for now, let's go ahead and get these drives installed and then uh, take a look at what storage we're going to use for uh, fixed disks. Now I'm going to be putting these two floppy drives up top, but something interesting to point out about this case down here are these screws. These screws hold in little tabs that give you half height rests for the drives. This is cool because this means if you put a half inch drive right here or half height, then it has something to rest on. But you can remove these and fit a full height drive like this IBM Tandon drive and it will be just fine in here. Other cases I have with lots of drive bays like this just have two that are missing the tab in between. So it's really nice that this one has an option to change it instead. Floppy drives are always the worst thing to cable manage. The five and a quarter inch drives and the three and a half inch drives have the pins in opposite order. So you have to flip the cable and rotate it around to get them to connect and it just, it never looks good. All right, with the floppy drives in there, all that's left is to get the disc out we're going to install from. So let's go ahead and unseal this copy of DOS 622. Before we think about putting a hard disk in here and getting the install going, I want to open up these floppies and try booting from the first one just to make sure that they work right. Old floppies can be a bit finicky. So far it's looking good. Alright, that's totally fine. It shouldn't find a hard disk. So as long as we have this going, that's working just fine. All right, so let's take a look at what I am going to do for a hard drive. Now it'd be more period correct to go with something like this two and a half gigabyte Seagate drive that's just IDE and pretty simple. But as I said, I want this to be an intermediary computer between my modern computers and my older XT class computers. So instead, I'm going to go for one of these SD to IDE adapters with an SD card that'll be easy to load the software into and off of this computer. Now I've actually already fully done everything on here because I wanted to make sure that this would work. These are kind of notorious for not functioning correctly. So this SD card currently has a fully bootable install of DOS on here, but we're going to go ahead and wipe that and start from scratch here. So I know this is going to work and this is going to be very easy in the long run. Now I get to experience another fun part of this case. It just has nowhere this can really go. Um, this is the five and a half inch bay for hard drives like I mentioned. I think I'm gonna go ahead and put this here. I put cardboard on the bottom side of this because I like it when I don't burn down my house because I shorted a 20 year old power supply. So that'll work well for now. In the future though, I'm going to 3D print a mount to attach to these two bolt points and then make a adapter to allow me to access from one of the copious 25 pin ports on the back. So that'll be really useful, but for now I'm gonna reach in there all awkward like and uh, screw this in place right there. Actually, I found if I folded it forward like this, then I could get the other part of the IDE cable to reach up here, which should be able to fit on the back of my IDE CD drive I'll be putting in here, which I always wanted at the bottom. So that's going to be nice. The drive I'm putting in there is really long, so I'm very confident that it will reach. So uh, with that installed, 
we're now ready to install the operating system. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, we're all ready to set up DOS on here. But first, there's one thing I have to know. The case is 26 and a half inches tall, and the monitor is 13 and a quarter. So the case is exactly twice as tall as the monitor. Yeah, this might be a slight mismatch. Well, anyway, let's turn it on and start the install. Now, the process I'm going to use here is going to be familiar to anyone who watched my video on installing DOS 5 on an XT IDE in an IBM 5150. Before we install the base operating system, I'm going to use a tool called Wipe Disk to clear the hard drive so Windows will be able to create all, or DOS, will be able to create all the partitions at once easily. Elsewise, it's a bit messy to do. So let me go ahead and put the disk with Wipe Disk on it in the computer and I will drop to DOS here, go over to the disk, and run wipe disk. Alrighty, type C, and it's gonna nuke the drive. It's done, now we need to restart. Wipe disk does more than just delete the partitions, it actually zeroes out the area of the hard drive that has all of the partition structure in it. DOS needs this because it doesn't very cleanly manage partitions. Hmm, so 622 will run on a personal computer with an 8088 or higher processor, but it has to have 512k of RAM. Yeah, that was an odd configuration. Anyway, back to this. Uh, we're going to drop down to F disk now, and that may not be on the uh, first disk of the setup process here. Oh, it will be. All right, so we're going to create a partition. And let's see, create a primary, yep. Fixed disk, uh, drive, maximum available. So I don't think this is gonna work out right. Um, let's see what it says though. Uh, okay, I feel like that didn't do anything. That's what I thought. After a reboot, we can see it says the total disk is eight gigs, which makes sense, and it created a two gigabyte partition. So I should be able to create another partition, and then I think I can have two primary and, uh, or no, three primary and one extended. Uh, let's just see what we can do here. Primary, okay, primary partition already exists. I might be thinking of uh, LVM on Linux. Anyway, uh, we'll just go ahead and create a extended partition. And then, um, no way, it won't let me make a six gig partition. I don't know, let's find out. There's no way it's gonna let that fly. No logical drives defined? Mm, oh, okay, yeah, now I have to make, yeah, all right, there we go. Yep, this is what I was thinking. Bam, perfect, okay. Escape to continue, all right. Display drive info. Uh, the extended partitions, yes. And there we go, awesome. All right, so we have all the drives we can. Um, this is a 32 gig card, it's only gonna show the eight gigs. If I had an eight gig card that it worked correctly with, I would have used that, but I couldn't find one, so maybe someday I'll swap it down to a smaller drive. But uh, that should be it, we gotta restart now. And then we can start formatting the partitions. Hmm, I didn't know that. You just hold down shift or press F5 to skip your config sys and autoexe.bat. That's nice. Alrighty, let's drop back to this. Um, we're going to go, to go ahead and do format C, and I'll throw the uh, S on there just for fun. That may not work because I didn't capitalize C. That looks like it is. This isn't going to be the uh, full install on here. This I still have to run through the setup process, but this will work out fine for now, and then uh, the setup process will be good. Volume label, DOS. Okay, now we're going to format. That was C, next will be D. All right, now I'm just gonna go ahead and format the remaining three drives on here. Um, each of these is going to have a particular use. DOS will be for games. Uh, E or D will be for games. Uh, e will be for um, uh, what was uh, I had a, a like a particular use case. Uh, I'll just make that temp space and then uh, no, that's not temp space. F is temp space. Um, this one's easy. Games 
And then, uh, I don't know, I'll just... What is this one gonna be? Uh, I don't know, let's make this programs. Just whatever. Prog. Then the last one will be temp. Alright, it's time to run the install. So, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, hard disk has found DOS files. Nope, we're gonna replace those, and that's just because I formatted with the uh, slash S option. So... Yep. Uh, let's see here. I wonder if that will have confused it. It's, this says upgrade on it, but it's not really an upgrade. It, it will still do a full clean install, so it's kind of tricky like that. Okay, uh, let's see here. That all looks good. I'll put everything in DOS. Yep. All right. Now we'll just end up swapping out between disks as it goes along. Disc two. Wow, only 21% for disc one, huh? That's, there's a lot on disc two and three then. Disc three. And we're only halfway done. Huh. That's interesting. Remove all disks. I believe we are done. Oh yeah. All right. Let's see what happens. Right. Guess I can take the white disk floppy out now. That looks pretty good to me. I believe we have DOS fully installed. So I'm curious what it stuffed in config. So let's see that. And no EMM 386. So I'm wondering if I should add that probably. But yeah, uh, that's pretty good. Okay. That's bare bones DOS install. So we have more hardware to add still. Now the first thing we need to do is finish installing our storage devices. There were a lot of DOS games that came out on floppy disk, but DOS came out in the middle of the CD revolution, so there are just as many great DOS games on CD. So we're going to need a CD drive. And the drive I'm going to go with for that is my NEC Multispin 4-Disc Changer Drive. Now, you may remember, if you've been watching this channel for a while, that I actually put this in my old Windows 98 machine. I would also like to iterate that I have two Inwin Q500 Windows 98 builds, so yeah, it gets a bit confusing. Anyway, I'm deciding to put this in the DOS PC I'm building here because really the drivers for this are best suited to DOS. I couldn't get this to work in single drive mode in Windows 98, so I'm hoping DOS is going to be a better fit for it. Now they had to uh, fit quite a few really awesome parts in here to make this thing work, so it is a very long disk drive, and hopefully it's properly configured to be slave, so I don't have to worry about that. But it fits in here just fine with the cable being so short. There is no flex at all, so yeah, that was convenient. And now is where I get to reap the benefits of having the hard drive be an SD card because I was just able to copy the drivers for it directly onto the SD card from my main computer. So getting that set up was extremely easy. All right, I also went ahead and added a little prompt here to let me know what drive is what on this computer. So let's go ahead and test out our CD drive with Whiplash so we can make sure that that's working correctly. Go ahead and change over to G and get the directory listing. Awesome. All right, let's go ahead and, and install it. So this will be the first game on this computer now. Fun fact, I believe Whiplash is known as Fatal Inertia in some other territories, so... If this game looks familiar, but you don't recognize the name, that might be why. I might be wrong, it might be something else. Also, curse people who cut off the UPC to mail it in, but at least they kind of left it intact? I don't know. Alrighty. Alrighty. 
And there we go, it's working, but, um, there's no sound. S hmm. I guess we'll have to install the sound card next. Now, the sound card for this build has been a bit of a sticking point, and this is the one that I'm going to go with. Now, this isn't my ideal sound card. This is an ESS audio drive, and it is a Sound Blaster 16 clone. Now, this isn't a bad sound card. It's got a genuine OPL on it, game port, all the same ports as the Sound Blasters. It's just not the one I want to go with. I've actually been building up quite a collection of sound cards, an AW32, uh, Multi Media Vision Pro Audio Spectrum, this is a Sound Blaster 2, and this is a Sound Blaster 16, but none of these are going to work for me. Well, maybe the Sound Blaster 2, but supposedly this one doesn't work. I haven't tested it yet, and I need to spend some time debugging it. But none of these, except for that, have the feature that I need of being able to disable the MIDI on the card, because I want to do some external MIDI sound module uh, testing in the future. So I'm gonna need that ability. And as far as I'm aware, based on the configuration on the back of this, I should be able to disable the game port, which I believe means that the MIDI will be disabled. So hopefully that will work, but we'll find out. Now for my speakers, I didn't find exactly what I was looking for either. I found something better. This is a complete little realistic hi-fi setup, and I think it's just absolutely perfect for using with an old computer like this. I mean, this is really tiny. Here's a cassette near the speakers for comparison. This is perfect. Now, uh, I have a SAP5 cassette player, SA10 amplifier, and a tape control center, which, if I start playing something in the tape player, you can see I can use to switch sources. Now, what's awesome about that is I'm likely to have a sound card and many MIDI sources, so I'm going to want to be able to switch between those and something like this is perfect. Now, I will eventually need to have a way of mixing channels as well, and I have that covered, but we'll get to that later because I don't think I'm going to get to any MIDI stuff in this video. Okay, I popped the sound card in there, connected the speakers, reconfigured Whiplash, which, side note, the ESS audio drive chip in there is actually a Sound Blaster Pro clone, not a Sound Blaster 16, so I learned that. And I've got Whiplash here now, but uh, Whiplash isn't quite working right. I swapped out the monitor because I didn't know what was going on, uh, so it seems like Whiplash isn't always outputting video for some reason. I can skip through some stuff and get to the uh, attract screen, like an arcade machine would use, and that seems to work, and obviously it makes sound now. There we go. Uh, yeah, that works, but the instant you try to go to a menu, uh, it stops outputting video for some reason, so... Hmm. Still have some weird issues to work out. But I think for right now I should try a uh, different game. A game more likely to work. And what's one of the easiest games to run? Doom. But Doom's actually a little too easy, so let's make it just a little more difficult and run Sigil. I was thinking that Sigil wasn't running quite as well as it should, and I decided to check out original Doom here to make sure that this is running correctly, and I don't think this is hitting the frame rates that it really should be, so I think we might need to change something about the build here. Now, originally I wanted to go with this Diamond Stealth 24 S3 based 1 megabyte SVGA card mostly because I have the box, but I think I should go with this Diamond SPEA Mirage Video, which uses an S3 and has one megabyte of video memory, and is SVGA instead, for one simple fact, the connector. This one's a PCI card, and this one's a 16-bit ISA card. 
And I do believe that's going to make a world of a difference. All right, here I've put in the PCI card and Doom is running a lot smoother. Now, if it's hard to tell how much smoother, let's overlay the 16-bit ISA card footage alongside it. Yeah, the difference there is pretty dang noticeable. Now, the performance benefit alone is worth it to switch over to the PCI card, but I have a little question here. Would this fix Whiplash? It would be weird if it just didn't work because it was ISA. Well, Whiplash works fine now. I have full graphics and everything. It maybe runs a little bit faster, not too much though. But most importantly, this time the menu actually works, so you could start a game. I can't right now though, because I don't have the CD in, and it's gonna complain about that. But there's something more important that I want to check if it's going to work. Strife. Yes, I am aware that the theme of this video is, I like Doom, because, well, it's true. Now, Strife is of particular interest to me because it took me a really long time to find a copy of this game, and I was very excited to play it when I finally got it, and I couldn't get it to work. I actually spent quite a bit of time trying to troubleshoot exactly what was going on, and I made a big long thread on Twitter about it, and in the end, I couldn't get it working. But all of that was before I had the PCI video card, so maybe Strife will work now. I intend to find out. I would say that is a complete success. Oh, it's really good to get this running. I've been trying to get this on working on this computer. Well, maybe not this exact configuration, but the test configuration I've been using these parts in since December. So uh, this is all the magic of that PCI VGA card. Okay. For now, I think we need to go from the complete opposite spectrum, from a game where you start out as a prisoner who shanks a guard to escape, to a Disney game about building roller coasters. But there's one thing we're going to need to do before we can play this. Why Disney Coaster? Because it's a game that has under its requirements a mouse. All right, so let's take a look at getting this working by getting this working. Now, I haven't been focusing too much about what I've been putting in my auto exec file, so let's go ahead and take a look at what I've got in there. Now, I've got a go to and some labels in here, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but for now, I just want you to see that. Well, okay, so I put uh, the generic CD driver in here as a troubleshooting step for getting the CD drive working, but I have that commented out because I don't need that. Um, here I have the driver that's unique to the CD changer, and then down here we have the mouse driver so all you have to do to get the mouse working is just run this program As a matter of fact you don't even need to put this in your auto exec you could just leave the executable somewhere and when you want to run a mouse driven application you can just start this file but it's nice to have it loaded when the computer starts so you don't have to worry about that so let's go ahead and shut the computer off and then restart it with the mouse driver being loaded in the auto exec file it's important to shut the computer off before you plug in a PS2 device because PS2 was not originally designed to be a hot plug interface and you can cause problems with overloading the power supply when you plug something in and I've heard about damaging motherboards from doing that. So just as a precaution, you probably don't want to plug in a PS2 device while the computer's on. All right, we're loaded up with the mouse driver having been launched and I've already installed Coaster, so let's go ahead and try it out. Thank you. 
All right, let's go ahead and give that mouse a try. Yep, working perfectly fine. Now, the track editor in this game is why you really need a mouse, because it's uh, it's a pretty complicated setup here. You could do this with a keyboard if you were really, really determined, but yeah, implementing the mouse just made this a, a lot simpler. All right, so the mouse is working just fine because we have the program loaded. We've got the CD drive fixed, so we're doing pretty good. But loading those two things can cause a bit of an issue. Now, I don't have a lot of games that are an example of this, but I do have at least one, and that is Hyperspeed. So let's go ahead and try and launch Hyperspeed and see what happens. 28K more free memory needed. We have 20 megs of RAM in this, and you're telling me this DOS game is trying to use all 20 megs? Not quite. This is a game that goes right up to the limits of conventional memory and really needs as much free as possible. So what's happening is our CD and mouse drivers are loaded into this same space of memory and it's not leaving enough left for the game. So we're gonna have to go ahead and disable those and then try and run the game. But it would be really inconvenient to have to remark out all the drivers you want to load just for one game. So there's actually a very useful option you can add to your config sys. You can create a menu that will allow you to choose what lines are run when the computer is started. So I've gone ahead and created two different categories here. TSR, which is Terminate and Stay Resonant Programs, like the CD-ROM drivers and mouse, and MEM light RAM, which tries to load as few things as possible. So under TSR, I have high MEM, which can confuse some software as well, the CD-ROM drivers, and mouse is actually in the auto exec. So let's go and take a look at that. Back in auto exec, we can use the config variable to choose which label to go to, and that will allow us to run similar options over here. So again, I have TSR, which runs the smart drive, the CD-ROM drivers, and then runs cute mouse. Mem does nothing again, and then it prints my little greeting, which makes life a bit easier to remember exactly what's where when you have eight drives. Oh no, I have 10 drives in DOS already. But with that, now we can restart and choose light RAM from my little boot menu, and then hyperspeed should run. And right after this, we get our menu. So I made it a three second timeout on here as well. You do that at the uh, default menu item uh, option. So here we can choose which one we want. I'm gonna pick light RAM and there we go. It booted super quick because it skipped all of the CD drivers, which the CD driver for the changer is really, really slow. So let's go ahead and try changing to the folder where hyperspeed is and running it. Now we don't have a mouse. After this, I'll see if I can load the mouse driver and still have enough free RAM to do this. But here we go. The game runs just fine. Ah, these types of copy protection are the most annoying. Aha, there we go. This is definitely one of those games where you also need the uh, controls right next to you. Now, wait, is this guy shooting me? Oh, uh-uh, we're gonna take care of this problem. Oop, I missed. Alrighty, there we go. Yep, game's running fine. Okay, so I ran Cute Mouse directly, uh, so we can see if we can load this game with the mouse uh, enabled. We can run a 570k program. So let's go back over to games, see how big hyperspeed is. It is, oh, it's only 82. Well, okay, that should be, well, might, maybe it'll work. Let's see. Yes, I have a mouse. Now, what does mouse do? Ah, mouse does work. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, inverted mouse is weird. Uh, uh. Bam. Awesome. All right, we've got software pretty much figured out now. So now it's time to add in some more hardware. And I said I wasn't sure if I was going to do MIDI in this, but I decided let's go ahead and do it. This isn't going to be a full look into MIDI on here, but a quick preview of what's coming up. So I want to use my Roland SE55, obviously. And to do that, I'm going to be using a PC MIDI card. Now I was sent this a while back and I haven't been able to use it in anything because, well, it's not gonna run that great in the 5150. So I've needed a 486 type PC and I finally have one. 
Now, this is really, really easy to set up. All you have to do is just plug it in and then it works. All the drivers and software to use this are built into the games, like most of the hardware in here. I haven't even set the blaster environment variable for the sound card yet. I should really do that. But yeah, let me throw this in the computer and then we'll try it out. Now you may have noticed this card doesn't exactly have a MIDI out port on it, and that's because it's a little different. It's not the typical MIDI out like a game blaster, it just goes direct to MIDI connectors on here, because this thing emulates an MPU 401, so you don't need that. So it's not exactly compatible with the uh, game port out put on a standard sound card. Now I'm finally ready to show you why I'm so happy with this setup to use with my SC55 and, oh hey, an MT32. Now I'm gonna go into all of this in a bit more detail when I do a review of the MIDI card because there's a little bit more going on here than you can see and that's part of why I like this because there's some stuff in the back but I don't need to ever touch that. Um, but this is it. Now, sound is actually live and I can select whatever sound source I want from here without needing to change anything else. So I can switch now to MT32. And it works fine. I can switch to SC55. And I can even switch to cassette. But I have one more trick up my sleeve. There's a fourth switch input that allows me to select this little audio cable I have coming out here for whatever music I want to play at the time. Now this setup does leave all of the MIDI devices on and at all times and always running all of the music, but I can just go ahead and turn them off if I'm not gonna use that source, so it's not that big of a deal. But I'm really, really happy with the simplicity of this setup. It's just gonna be so nice to use in the long run, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this. The ease of connecting the SE55 and the MT32 is entirely down to the PC MIDI card because I don't need to have a switcher like, say, a Roland MPU-104. So this is just the best possible setup that I can imagine. Now, if you wanted to add in more MIDI sound sources, it would get a bit more complicated, but I'm happy with just these two. I mean, if I can track down some more, like I could actually connect my Yamaha Disc Orchestra to this, then I would need to get a little bit more creative with the MIDI channel routing, but for now, yeah, I'm super happy with this. All right, I am really happy with the progress that we've been making on this today, and I think that I'm almost done with this. There's just one more part I really wanna get in here right now, and that is a network card. Now, I'm going with this gigafast ethernet card. It's just a Realtek chipset internally. Um, I'm only going with this because I have the driver disk, so it's going to be very easy to set up. Matter of fact, this is super easy to set up. It's basically exactly the same thing as Cute Mouse. Let me go ahead and get this plugged in and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so I've got the card installed. I mean, you've seen PCI cards plugged in before, so I just skipped that. I also put in the driver disk, which is in drive A. And if we list out the folders here, uh, we can see the one that we actually need up here at the top. RTS PKT or, or real-time send packet. I'm not sure what RTS stands for, but PKT's packet. Um, so we can go over to that, RTS PKT. And in here is the only file we really need to worry about, which is the COM file, because that is the driver. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that file over to the little driver folder I've been building up. And now we're going to add that to our auto exec file and we will load that on startup, which will activate the PCI card. Well, it'll define a software port that software will use to access the card. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, that's all that needs to be added in there and it should work fine. I'm gonna go ahead and save this and then open up the uh, config sys file and make a little note in the TSR loader here that this also loads internet stuff. And then now I am done. Okay, now that the computer is restarted with the network driver installed, I can use it to do stuff. So 
obviously there's a lot of cool things you could do with this. You could probably connect to the BBSs. You could connect to a network multiplayer game. But what I'm going to use it for most is FTP. So let me go ahead and demonstrate this. I'm going to be using MTCP, which is by Mike Brutman, which is a whole suite of tools that allows you to connect using DOS to other computers over the internet. Now, I'm just going to be connecting to my server locally uh, using FTP, which is very convenient for me because this means that I don't have to sneaker net files onto here. And that I just did while I was talking is all it takes to connect. You just write the FTP and the IP address, then log in. Now, here we have my server where I like to put all my files for old computers. I like to access this from Windows 98 as well. So this is very useful. Now, the first thing I want to do here is try archiving a game. So we're going to go ahead and change to the games folder. I'm going to make a directory and I'm going to call it coaster. There we go. Now we can CD coaster. Now what I'm going to do here is I can see where I am on the uh, local machine and I can change to coaster here as well. And now I can upload all the files in the coaster folder to the server. And I believe I changed into coaster. So yes, I think there is a way of doing this without having to say yes to all of them, but I don't remember it. And there we go. Coaster has now been uploaded to the server. So if I wanted to copy that from the server to another computer, I could do it right from there. It's very convenient for backing stuff up. Now, obviously a better way of backing stuff up is making disk images. Okay, so this is a folder of just a bunch of batch files and a bin folder that I'll have to manually copy over um, that allows me to create disk images of any floppy disk I put in my DOS computer. So let me go ahead and download all of this so I can try doing that on here. Okay, that should be everything I need. So let me go ahead and quit. And here I am in image. Now I'm gonna put the disk for the uh, network card back in and we're going to run R144, which is read a 1.44 megabyte floppy. And there we go, successfully imaging the network driver disk. This tool I'm using is a DSK image, which is also written by Mike Bruttonman, actually. Um, I would say this is my favorite uh, disk image utility here, at least that I can run from DOS. So yeah, I'm very happy for all of the software he's written. It's really good and very useful. Okay, no sectors were unrecoverable. That's a good image. So what I can do now is go to from, I can see I have the 144.img. I'll ren that to uh, PCI net. No, well, actually, I did 144.img to PCI net.img. There we go. Now I'm going to go back to my server. Go to the drivers folder. And from here, I actually, oh, I already imaged that floppy. That's hilarious. Well, I can just show you. Um, we'll do put PCI net dot img and there we go i've successfully uploaded the disk image file to my server so it's very easy for me to go ahead and write disk images or create disk images i can write them just as easily actually and uh, upload them to my server so it makes this a really useful archiving computer all right that's it i'd say the computer is fully finished i went ahead and completely reassembled it put the rest of the filler plates back in and i think it's done I got my network card set up, sound, MIDI, video, it's it's awesome. I'm really going to enjoy this thing. And speaking of that, I think it's time that we end this video and uh, I need to play some Sigil because I haven't actually had a chance to play that yet. Fun little side thing, since I posted the video of me playing that before, someone clued me into a modified version of the original Doom EXE that will let you run Sigil as the fifth episode. So. Sweet. But for now, that's it. There will be more parts added to this later. For one, I didn't get to the SCSI card, just like last time with the Windows 98 build. Most of the SCSI stuff that I've found it really only wants to work in DOS. I've tried to get it working on the Windows 98 PC, but without much luck. So this is going to be the computer to use for that in the future. But for now, that's it. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this 486 DOS PC build. If you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it. I'll see you next time.